pixel poker was the challenge number two. We are given binary file and a text description. Let's start by running the challenge. Of course, just to be on the safe side, we'll do it in virtual machine. We can see a standard window with a menu and the whole area is covered with colorful pixel. We may click on them 11 times before we are presented with a message that we failed and we should play again. Let's just spend a few more seconds to see if we can trigger any other interesting behavior. Before we jump into the disassembly, let's summarize what we know at this point. We have an application with a random image with colorful pixels that shows X and Y coordinate in the top bar while hovering, that we can click on 11 pixels, that shows a dialog box with an information that we failed. Let's open the challenge in Ghidra and try to locate places where those actions that we've listed are coded. Ghidra identifies this application as 32-bit Windows executable. Let's just click OK to import, then double-click on the name to open the main editor. Now we can run the analysis. Just keep the default options. In a couple of seconds we can dig into the opcodes. Before we dive deeper into the disassembly, let's pause for a moment and discuss how we could start the analysis. One option would be to start from the top function and drill into sub-function down to the tiniest function that exists. This could be called a top-down approach. Another one could be that we start from a specific part of the binary, for example a string or other identifiable piece of information, and we go up until we reach an interesting function. This could be called a bottom-up approach. Which is better? It depends. With this binary, both would work, but I will start from the top. Back to Kitra. Let's start by filtering entry function. We can show it disassembly. It's rather simple. There is not much choice where we can drill down. This function is a bit more complex, but we can identify some of the interesting calls like get command line w and multiple exit calls. This might be the function that prepares command line arguments and passes them to the main function. But which one of those is the main? We know that standard main function can return a status code that is used by the operating system. So let's see what is being returned by this function and trace back to the function that sets that variable. In our case, ivar2 is returned and the last function that sets that local variable is 4016fo. That's our main. Let's rename it then. Hit L and type main and confirm with enter. Now double click and we can start analyzing the main function. Here it is a bit more like an application code. Why? Well, let's call it experience of writing Windows apps as well as looking at too much code. We see a call to load image W. This might be our pixelated image, two calls to load string W, some text resources, and what we see near the bottom of this function is a standard message pump function known in Win API application. What we don't know yet are function 401120 and 401040. Let's open the first one. Ghidra did an amazing job here identifying correctly the variable type and providing to us a lot of useful information. What we are doing here is that we register a window class specifying its attributes along with a function that will handle events for it. Awesome! Let's rename this function to register window class and we can go back to the parent function. The second function is responsible for allocating some memory, creating the window and showing it. So we can rename that one to create window. Back to our register window class and from there we can navigate to LPFN winproc parameter. Usually a standard implementation of this function is a big switch statement that goes over message param and handling specific cases. This assembly is made of if statements and instead of events name we have numbers but Ghidra allows us to change that. If we suspect something is a value that is defined constant, 
we can right click on that value, choose set equate and from the list of selected values, pick the right one. Unfortunately, we need to know what are the right ones. In case of win procedure messages values, we are interested in those prefix with wm underscore. Now it's much more clear. Let's do that for all of them. Setting the WM names already presents us with parts of the code that seems familiar to our application exploration. Can we find the flag then? We can see an equate for mouse move and close by a string that could be one of those we saw in the Windows title. Near L button down, we could see a womp womp message. There's also an interesting check with a value of 10 nearby. Could this be our limit compared with the current click count? It might be. For the moment, let's rename this variable to click count. If the 10 clicks limit is not satisfied, we increase the click count. So this is really starting to look like our counter. Next, we have a check. Let's try to understand what is happening here. Value of variable named uvar8 is being compared with a reminder of value located at 412004 divided by a value located at 413280. But the value at address 412004 is not taken in full. It has a suffix of 04. We'll get back to this. What's uvar8? Let's trace back where it's being set. If we click on it, Ghidra will highlight all the places where it's being used. And we can see that it's being set to param4, which is parameter to Windows Pro of type lparam. In the docs for l button down, we can read that lparam holds x and y coordinates of the mouse position. Lower bits are the x coordinate, while higher bits are the y coordinate. So uvar8 is the x coordinate. Let's rename it that way. For the second part of this track, we do a similar comparison, but this time between uvar6 and string located at 412004 and the value at address 413284. We can do the same trace back to initial place where uvar6 is set and determine that it's the y coordinate. Now's the time for the mysterious global variables names that. They seems not to be set anywhere. See how they are missing wxref? But checking all the read accesses, we can see they are being referenced in our create window functions as values for right and bottom coordinates. Those are just width and height of our image. They are also used to calculate how much memory we need to store the pixel data. Width times height, times 4 bytes per pixel. But since those are unknown from the disassembly, we need to find out them other way. For the moment, let's switch from the disassembly. Let's click the RSRC section in top left corner of Gitra. It will show us resources located in the binary. Image had an ID of 81 hex, so let's scroll down to that ID and expand the node that will give us values for width and height. Since the game was about clicking the correct pixel, and here we are comparing the mouse X and Y coordinate with specific values, this is very likely to our win function. We need to find out what are the correct coordinates, but how we can divide string by a number? Let's find out. Strings are a sequence of bytes, and those bytes put together gives us a string. We can always treat them as numbers. In our case, we have a string flare on and the corresponding values in hex are 46, 4C, 41, 52, 45, 2D, 4F, 6E. But we don't take the whole value to be used in division. This is where those fancy underscore zero, underscore four suffixes comes into play. If you would take a look at the disassembly, we would notice that the assembly instruction that is used here to load the value is move EAX. EAX is 42-bit register, so it can only hold 4 bytes. 
This is what Ghidra is telling us with this suffix. It translates to load 4 bytes starting from index 0. So now we know everything, right? Not quite. If we would take 4 bytes from flare on string, so that would be 4, 6, 4, C, 4, 1, 5, 2, that would give us a number OX, 46, 4, C, 4, 1, 5, 2, and the reminder from dividing it by width, which was OX, 2, E, 5, would give us a value 302 in decimal. Taking the last 4 bytes from flare on string would give us OX, 4, 5, 2, D, 4, F, 6, E, and dividing it by the height, which was OX, 2, 8, 1, would give us 194 in decimal. But clicking on that point won't give us the flag. We need to learn about NDNS. Storing values less than a byte can hold is easy. We can write it as such and we don't have to figure out how to read it back. Problem is when we want to store larger numbers. Where's the start and where's the end? For example, if we would store number OX123456789, we could store it as 12345678 or 78563412. In first case, the byte order would be from the highest bytes that build the number and in the second case from the lowest bytes. We can call those respectively big endian and little endian. Getting back to our challenge. Remember this initial Gidra dialog when loading the challenge? It was stating that this is a little endian binary, so if we load 4 bytes from flare on string, so bytes 46, 4C, 4, 41, 52, they would produce a 4 byte number equal to OX, 52, 41, 4C, 46, reverse order. Now we can get the correct value, which is 95 decimal. And the same for the second value, which gives 313 in decimal. And that's the correct pixel. Let's just get the flag and wrap with this challenge. It's not so easy to find the exact pixel, but hey, it worked. See you in the challenge number three.